Welcome to our Vessel Performance Info Webinar, Integrated Modular Digital Components for Vessel Performance, Part 3, Commercial Decisions and Regularity Compliance. Our guest speakers today are Andreas Breck, CEO of Miros Motion, Christy Asaley, Emissions Product Lead of Zero North, Petter Anderson, Senior Vice President, Shipping Digital of Storm Geo, and Risto Juhani Kariranta, CEO of Ahti Climate. If you have any questions about the topic today, please type them in the Q&A section and we'll get them answered for you at the end of the presentation. Here is our host, Carl Jeffrey from Digital Ship to explain more. So we're looking today at digital tools to support commercial decision making and regulatory compliance relating to vessel performance. And the topics we're going to cover are evaluating energy saving devices, managing your fuel EO maritime compliance, modeling and forecasting your CII compliance and emission trading scheme costs and reporting your emissions to charters with digital tools. This is the third of our series of three webinars on modular digital components for vessel performance. The reason we're doing these webinars is that we can see that digitalization for vessel performance has got such a broad scope and it's so complicated. It's likely you're going to need a portfolio of different digital tools to do it. And this means they'll all need to integrate together, and that's going to be easier to do if they're modular, which means we've got a clear idea of what each tool does and what it needs and how it can fit together with others. And it might be a good idea to start thinking about how we're going to do all this now when we're making the initial decisions of what systems we're going to use. So in the first of the two webinars in this series, we looked at the topic and we looked at gathering data from ships and building ship performance models. And today we're looking at how digital tools can help drive investment decision-making, commercial decision-making, compliance and communications with other stakeholders. And we've got four very interesting companies presenting today. So we can keep the whole webinar into an hour and allow time for questions. I've asked each company to keep their presentation to about 10 minutes. So they'll only be able to present a small part of what their companies do. So first, Miros Motion is going to talk about how shipping companies can assess the contribution your energy saving devices are making and make decisions about which ESDs to invest in. We're going to hear from Andreas Brecker, the CEO. He's based in Aska, just outside Oslo. Second, Storm Geo is going to talk about technologies to predict your end of year CII score and help you operate the ship to achieve your desired score and also how you can predict your costs under the EU emission trading scheme. And we're going to hear from Petter Anderson, the C Senior Vice President Shipping Digital. He's based in Oslo. Then we're going to go to Finland. So RT Consulting is going to talk about how you can plan compliance with fuel EU maritime and ways to reduce the costs of it. And we're going to hear from Risto Juhani Kariranta, the company founder. He's the former shipping performance manager with biofuels producer and oil refiner Neste. And fourth, we're going to hear from Zero North about better ways to communicate your emissions data with charterers, perhaps using the Energy Leap digital standard. Digital Zero North is based in Copenhagen, but we're going to hear from Christy Assayi, who's a specialist in emissions reporting and analytics, and she's based in Greece. So you can put questions in the Q&A box at any time. Um, speakers probably won't answer them during the presentations, but they can answer them by typing after they, they've given the presentations if they wish to, and we can take questions at the end. And it, it would help if you can start a question by stating which speaker it's for. So I'd like to invite Andreas to start his talk. Cheers. Thank you, Carl. Uh, let me share my screen. Right, there we go. Um, yes, again, thanks, Carl, and thanks for um, for for having me. Um, I've I've actually really uh, enjoyed this webinar series. Um, and I believe the topic of uh, modularity is uh, important for our industry. Very few of us can deliver systems that meet every need um, of the shipping community, um, but many of us address specific issues really well. And modularity allow our customers to pick and choose the solutions that are important to them and uh, important to, to their business needs. Today, um, I will be talking about validating the effect of um, energy saving devices and ultimately the investment decisions that uh, owners uh, take. Um, and I will also touch um, uh, on one more topic, 
um, dynamic fuel tables, uh, also provided as a modular service and uh, hopefully quite relevant for um, some of my uh, co-presenters here today. Um, right. So first to put um, this into the context of, of our company. Um, Miros Motion um, has built a, I would say, focused uh, platform with a, a select number of applications. Um, modular, of course, uh, standalone uh, even if the customer chooses uh, that. And uh, this platform and these applications, they leverage um, our technology for measuring um, waves, um, currents, um, and speed through water. We, um, we combine that data with high frequency performance data from uh, the ship, typically power um, or fuel oil consumption. And based on that, we provide unique insights to owners and operators um, across these four topics uh, shown here. Uh, the first is our uh, performance application, which is called Vessel Technical Index. Furthermore, we have a charter uh, party performance module. Uh, we have a dynamic fuel table uh, application, which I will touch on today. And we also have a real-time uh, anti-roll assistant for, um, for, for typically container and row row uh, vessels. Um, so to the specific topic of today, uh, which is measuring and verifying the effect of energy saving devices. Um, and the main point here is that we offer a solution to do just that for a ship in service in all operating conditions. And that's really um, the crux of, of this. The difficult part is to um, measure uh, the actual savings of maintenance or energy saving technologies, not only in a, a test tank, uh, not only theoretically, um, but actually in service and in all operating conditions. The methodology um, that we use is built on a a uh, very new recommended practice um, by DNV. It was released uh, uh, only this uh, September. And this is what the uh, vessel technical index um, is. Um, and this index leverages uh, our uniquely accurate sea state measurements to weather normalize the performance or more specifically the power curve and ultimately the consumption of the vessel. So what we, what we do is that we, we, we measure the power um, uh, in operation, and then we allocate through our measurements, the uh, share of that power being used to overcome uh, the waves, um, the uh, currents that you're uh, sailing in, and uh, the wind and the uh, water temperature that you're operating in. And then we are left with the uh, actual performance of uh, the vessel normalized for uh, the environmental conditions uh, around the ship at any given point in time. And this also then makes us um, able to measure the effect of energy saving uh, devices, as well as any maintenance activities. Um, the real innovation in this is obviously uh, several things, but primarily the accuracy that we can provide to make this possible. We are in fact able to quantify um, the effect of um, energy saving technologies and maintenance activities uh, down to uh, as little as um, uh, three percentage points uh, exemplified by a, a, a propeller polishing. 
Um, the other important, I think, uh, innovation in this is that we are able to get the result immediately and not after weeks or even months of uh, noon report uh, based data. Um, so we help owners understand the effect of uh, ESDs on their specific vessels uh, for their specific trades, um, ranging from coatings to air lubrication, um, wind propulsion, or, or as I said, maintenance activities being uh, propeller polishing or or um, or hull uh, grooming or or cleaning. Um, the last point I want to make about the solution is that through our uh, cooperation and collaboration in developing this with uh, DNV, um, our measurements and results are uh, verified by DNV. Um, if that is required by the owner or, or uh, other stakeholders in, in the process. Um, so we, um, again, as a, as a modular digital service, we, we can provide um, a, um, a piping uh, straight to uh, DNV, where they uh, verify not only uh, the outcome, but uh, also the outcome in terms of um, accuracy and also the <clears throat> quality um, of the actual measurements uh, as the basis for the calculation. <clears throat> um, this was quite high level in terms of what this does, and I'm happy to, to, to um, take any questions on this um, uh, at the end of, of our, our webinar today. I also wanted to just touch on one more thing as we uh, discuss this um, technology and this platform. Um, and that is uh, an application coming also out of the Vessel Technical Index, uh, which we call Dynamic Fuel Tables, uh, which is, is quite relevant also for our, the, the um, co-presenters uh, today, Storm Geo and Sierra North. All weather routing uses a vessel's fuel table as an input parameter. Uh, with VTI, we provide up-to-date fuel tables based on the actual performance of a vessel. The typical use case is this. Your vessel leaves port and you receive weather routing advice from your provider. But how much did the hull and propeller performance deteriorate during the last port stay? As you know, traditional methods relying on noon report data will only tell you something indicative and only after weeks or even months of data collection and analysis, and then that journey is over. With our system based on Vessel Technical Index, we provide accurately updated fuel tables within 36 hours of leaving port, giving weather routers the correct input for the current journey and the advice given. Um, to summarize, um, Miros Motion provides two specific services or modular digital services that solves real challenges for owners and operators. First, weather normalized accurate performance monitoring to assess the effect of energy saving devices and maintenance. Two, we provide updated fuel tables to enhance the value of weather routing. That was all for me um, as an initial presentation, and I am very happy to take any questions on this um, at the end of uh, our webinar. Well, wow. well, that's great. Well, thank you very much. You'll see you've got a nasty question in there from Johan Carlson from Willanius Williamson. He's asking what happens if you do two... Uh, ESG installations at the same time. I guess I can maybe put that in with a tap. But if we go on to the next seven talk now, so we'll hear from uh, Peter Anderson, who's the senior vice president of shipping digital based in Oslo. And I've seen a great talk from Storm Geo about how you model the uh, CAI compliance. So I'd like to welcome Peter. Cheers. That's Carl. And, uh, let me share my screen here. Yep, no good. Can you all see it? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. 
Uh, very well. <clears throat> Thanks, Andreas, for some uh, interesting uh, uh, insights from Miro's Ocean. I will talk about something similar, but also a little bit uh, different. So um, I call the presentation Digital Tools for, for Decarbonization. And uh, what I want to share with you today is... Um, let's see if I can get my screen to work here. Here we are. Sorry for that. I'm going to talk about a little bit about how, how global weather impacts actual vessel performance, how we take uh, the effect of, of changing weather conditions into our models. And then I will share with you how we use uh, machine learning uh, principles for having accurate vessel baselines, similar as Miro's Ocean talked about, but also a little bit different. And then I will uh, do a use case for a... Uh, vessel sailing from uh, the, across the Atlantic uh, Ocean and look at how we can use our tools for estimating the CII and the UETS. So Storm Geo, who are we? Uh, a core of what we deliver and who we are is, is weather routing and voyage optimization. Uh, this we have been doing for, for more than 10 years. Uh, and as an average, we do routing, voyage optimization for more than 70,000 voyages per year. So every day around 3,000 vessels are using Storm Geo active route advice when sailing from A to B. So um, if you're transferring it into to numbers, uh, according to IMO, uh, weather routing uh, can save as much up to 3%, uh, 1% to 3% of fuel per voyage. You can transform it into quite considerable savings of 3.3 million tons of fuel saved since 2018. Um, all realistic numbers based on all the voyages that we conduct every year. And even if voyage optimization is key of what we do, we are doing quite much more from Storm Geo. So just as part of my introduction as well, I wanted to mention that weather routing is, is key, part of our deliverable. We have onboard tools for voyage optimization, where the crew uses our tools for a self-service routing on board and more than 5,000 ships. Uh, we, part of Storm Geo, we also have our chart of publications offering. We have onboard reporting systems. Uh, we have fleet performance management uh, deliveries uh, to more than uh, 3,500 vessels. So we are actively engaged uh, in shipping uh, and also other activities, but in shipping and routing on technical and environmental performance. So before we look at our tools, I want to talk a little bit about the weather because uh, that is uh, a key uh, element to consider when we talk about uh, estimations and accurate uh, calculations of CO2 and consumption. So what is this screenshot here? This is from the 1st of November at 1800, where we had a quite extreme uh, situation in the North Atlantic with three low pressures uh, at the same time. Um, from 1st of November to the 5th of November, we uh, almost for a week, there were low pressures coming into the Bay of Biscay uh, with, uh, uh, with waves more than seven meters the whole week for seven days. We have not seen anything like that in seven, eight years uh, from Storm Geo. And these kind of more extreme situations is more likely to happen during El Nino years, which there is a strong signal this year that there is an El Nino year. And why I'm talking about this technicalities around the weather is these weather situations is essential to take into account when giving a forecast for the vessel sailing from A to B in terms of what weather is that vessel likely to experience. So in our weather models, which is basis for our uh, tools. We use this 20 years of, of weather data and we split this into an El Nino year, a La Nina year, which, which is the opposite, and the neutral years. So this basis we use uh, when we have defined uh, these speed loss uh, factors, which we apply when we calculate how much speed loss is this vessel expected to experience in this weather situation at this given point of time. So we use the statistical data to calculate the expected speed loss for any typical uh, commercial vessel 
uh, in any typical weather situation. So we have pre-computed values based on this experience data for all uh, typical ship types and sizes. That's the one thing which is key for accurate estimations, having accurate speed loss calculations based on the real weather situations. And coming to the next point, <clears throat> what is the vessel expected to consume? Uh, many have good experience data with this. Uh, others do not have the same experience data for the vessels. So we can supply this also from Storm Geo. So we use this experience data and we have built uh, ship and size specific consumption curve models, uh, which we use in our uh, delivery uh, and in our tools. So the approach is, <clears throat> if, if you as a ship owner have no data at all, uh, we can give you a curve, which is based on neutralized sister vessel uh, information. If we have more information uh, from your vessel, uh, we can generate a specific consumption curve based on our experience data. And then secondly, if you are using our reporting tools and we have information about your ship, we calibrate this uh, standard curves to your specific vessel. So we use the reported events and we calibrate these current curves using a machine learning principle, which means that this consumption curve and this estimated consumption for a given speed will be different before and after a dry docking, for example. So it's a dynamic consumption curve uh, that will follow the performance of your vessel. And this is also exportable, uh, which can then be used in different uh, other applications as well, which is also a, a, a key thing, uh, a theme in, in this event, uh, this webinar as well, how this information can be used for other purposes, but also we use it in, in our service. So let's look at one example case here, um, a little bit of details, uh, but not necessarily need to, to look at all the details on the screen. I will explain what I mean here. So this is a from our web portal as insight. It is um, uh, what you see as the user. And here we have an oil tanker of uh, a little bit less than 160,000 dead weight tons uh, sailing from Houston to Rotterdam, which is approximately 5,100 nautical miles around seven days at sea. The vessel is laden and the draft is uh, 13.4 meters and the vessel has a calculated year-to-date CII of 2.786. So that's the starting point uh, for this uh, vessel. And then <clears throat> what I'm coming, coming to in a second is that what I've just been explaining about having the accurate estimation of the expected weather for this voyage combined with a dynamic uh, vessel baselines can give you an accurate estimation of actually what is going to happen when it comes to consumption uh, during this voyage. So let's first look at the CII part. We have uh, in our tools, we have dashboards for CII where you can monitor uh, each vessel's CII in your fleet. And also here I'm showing this for this specific uh, oil tanker how it looks like. They have a CII of 2.786, as I mentioned, and we are around here. This screenshot was from, from yesterday. So this is where they are. They are on a B rating. And then <clears throat> the question is how the next voyage will affect uh, the CII. We have uh, a couple of different calculators where you can go in and you include uh, the draft and the estimated speed and the and the, from the fuel that you are going fuel type that you're going to use uh, and we can calculate uh, the CII after the voyage based on that input data for for your planning purposes also um, we can apply the same logic and extend the estimation towards the end of the year uh, where you can have a a relatively good estimate of where you are likely to end up with the CII at the end of the year. So for CII purposes, uh, these digital tools uh, like this can be can be absolutely very useful. If we go beyond this and go back to the voyage, um, I will show you here another tool, which is we call a voyage calculator. 
which is built on the same principles, but also here estimating the uh, actual consumption expected for this voyage and also the expected emissions for the same voyage. So in this case, we are expecting uh, a little bit less than 2000 metric tons of, few, uh, of CO2 emitted, uh, corresponding to this consumption based on the uh, optimized voyage and the exact fuel pipes included at a, a calm sea speed of 30 knots. So again, the importance here is to have the accurate basis for these calculations. And then, as we know from next year, we have uh, shipping included in, in the UETS scheme, uh, where you also have to start paying for your emissions in and out of, of Europe. And if this voyage here, which is ongoing as we speak, if this was in January, the extra cost uh, for CO2 allowances uh, would be 38,000 US dollar. And the next years, it will even increase since the UETS scheme is gradually increasing. So this just illustrates also the importance uh, as we see it to have uh, accurate estimations and naturally also accurate uh, reporting of this data during this voyage. Lastly, uh, talking about the UETS, uh, we also have a, a solution for that, which is launched these days from Storm Geo, where we keep uh, track of uh, all the UETS uh, emissions per voyage or per leg or per time period, uh, which is also uh, exportable uh, to third parties for different purposes uh, uh, via an uh, API. That was what I planned to, plan to, to, to show to you today. And hopefully I was okay on the time there, uh, Carl. I think I will stop there and we can take more questions uh, later on. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, I'll see we're getting the gap from data gathering to uh, decision making. That's uh, fantastic. So please put any, any questions for uh, Andreas and uh, Peter in the chat box. So now we'll go to, or the Q&A box, we'll, we'll go to Helsinki. We're going to hear from... Uh, Risto Carreranta, so he's uh, got his own consultancy, RT Consulting, and formerly uh, performance manager with biofuels producer Neste. So um, fuel EU maritime is a European Union rules about taking the carbon out of your emissions, which is, uh, I think there's talk about international maritime organization doing the same thing globally. So it's something everyone's going to have to worry about no matter where you are. So I shall pass over to Risto. Cheers. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just... Where is Moss? Oh. Need to get the slide so start. Yep. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yep. Very good. Okay. So my name is uh, Risto Garinant, and I'm actually today having my Arti Climate hat on. Arti Climate is a is a new company providing tools for emission compliance, cost optimization, and and uh, let's discuss a little bit about what we can do today. First of all, let's take a, take a short look on the regulatory landscape. So while we are talking about emission compliance optimization, that happens in, in relation to uh, certain regulatory landscape. And, and, and like, uh, like Carl just mentioned, we have, uh, first of all, we have uh, IMO regulations that at the moment are, are concentrating on, on CII. Uh, but we in, in the pipeline after, after last summer's MEPC, we have a, have a, a potential that IMO will come up with their carbon levy or, or, uh, and or um, global fuel standard that would be somewhat equal to what um, certain European regulations are. So quite a lot of happening on this front. We don't know all the all the answers yet, but uh, a lot is cooking inside IMO at the moment. What comes to the European regulation, there we know know the playing field much better already, and 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 there is uh, actually there is uh, even even five regulations that have that touch point for for shipping. So we have a uh, uh, EU ETS that was mentioned here already here in the previous presentation indirectly uh, shipping will be shipping emissions will be uh, touched in renewable energy directive here on the top left 
part uh, because that is used for calculating the sustainability criteria and 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 uh, carbon intensities for the alternative fuels that will be used on board shipping. Uh, AFIR is then regulation for the distribution and 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 an infrastructure for uh, for this for for uh, providing these alternative fuels in the ports, energy taxation on the on the bottom right corner. I haven't heard much about that, so there was some discussion to put some kind of energy tax in in, in place in addition to all of this. Uh, but then in the middle we have the on my opinion, the most important uh, or, or, or let's say significant for shipping uh, regulation called fuel EU maritime, which will start to mandate ships to use low carbon fuels starting 2025. So there's not much going around with that. And because I think this is the most significant, so let's take a little bit more details out of that. So Fuel EU maritime is regulating the carbon intensity of the energy used on board. So what does it mean? It means that you can't bypass that by, by uh, using energy saving devices or, or improving the, the, the operational efficiency because you really have to have to put something into in the tank that has less carbon in it. And, and the first step is that 2025, this reduction needs to be 2% then 2036 and so and and then down the line, 2050, you need to have 80% reduction on this carbon intensity of the energy used on board. Uh, and the calculation of this uh, carbon intensity is uh, is a is a long process. So, so the the regulation is providing us a, a default factors for for the traditional fossil fuels, but for for all the alternative fuels. You pretty much need to calculate case by case what is the carbon intensity. So for example, uh, some of you are aware of the e-fuels, RFNBO, so, so fuels made out of uh, renewable electricity and, and, and captured carbon. So there you calculate the intensity based on, on, on the production environment, meaning that how much and from where you get the, get this renewable electricity and, and what is the process and, and, and uh, uh, how do you get uh, get, for example, this biogenic captured carbon into your into the production? So, for example, e-methanol coming from different locations might have completely different carbon intensities. And finally, there are some tools for making this a little bit more flexible. So there are uh, tools in this regulation called borrowing, banking, and pooling. So borrowing means that if you fail to to meet your targets during one one year then you can borrow from the future some compliance for your vessel and pay that back with the interest next year and the other way around if you have over compliance for one vessel you can bank it for the next years and, and consume it the year after for example and then finally pooling which is i think the most interesting tool here then it allows you if you define a pool make a contractual pool then you are allowed to transfer this over compliance between vessels and that's really powerful tool and providing flexibility for for the industry uh, because with that for example one e-methanol vessel e-methanol can reach carbon intensity like five grams of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions per megajoule uh, which is uh, when, when, for example, HFO, the same number is 92. So with one e-methanol vessel, you basically can kind of support 70 vessels consuming HFO in this pooling mode. And that means that, okay, one expensive vessel using expensive fuel, but then 70 vessels using extremely cost-effective fuel. And, and this strategy might be very interesting for you. Just for comparison, LNG vessel, depending a little bit on the engine type, could support perhaps, uh, for example, five vessel with traditional uh, HFO. And how this is enforced, uh, there is a penalty penalty clause in the regulation. And, and, and uh, here you can see some sample numbers. So for 
ton of HFO, the additional costs in, uh, starting 2025, roughly you would need to pay first of all within European waters 280 80 bucks for ETS cost and then 63 bucks for, for this penalty if you continue using that and not meeting the criteria. But this penalty due to this increasing target level, it's growing up fast. So 2030 penalty is already 158 bucks and, and then 2035 it will most probably already uh, exceed the, the ETS cost quite significantly. So we can see here in this breakdown that 361 bucks for the for the uh, fuel or maritime penalty 2035. Uh, so quite a lot of headache, uh, and that, that that's not all. So so while we start to to consider how do we how do we tackle this regulation, so. Uh, first of all, we need to change the mindset quite a lot. So previously we were purchasing fuel by tons in, in, in shipping industry. We didn't even consider much that how much energy that contains, but that will change after fuel your maritime. You need to think about how much energy you actually need and, and then the carbon intensity. So there is two extremely important parameters you need to all the time take into account. You, you, get, you need to get the exact amount of energy you need for the vessel, but take a look on the on the intensity of the fuel at the same time. So here in this uh, bottom left picture, we have a HFO having slightly above 40 megajoules per kilograms energy uh, and with a carbon intensity of uh, uh, about 92 grams. LNG has slightly more energy, to, so the gray bar there uh, and the intensity is slightly lesser than, than with the HFO. And then when we, for example, look at this e-methanol option, then energy content is very small. So by tons, you need much more this fuel. But on the other hand, the, the carbon intensity is very low. So could reach, for example, this five grams. And then you need to calculate around various different scenarios. What is the most optimal one uh, for reaching reaching the target levels with your fleet. And uh, saying out loud that this is will be a headache, but of course, why I'm here. So Arctic Climate is giving you the medicine for this headache. So we have a tool for, tool for creating quickly these kind of scenarios and assessing that what type of uh, alternative energy sources you could use and, and, and reaching out the, the, the most optimal cost level. So showing you some sample scenarios using this tool that we are able to provide. Uh, I took now our, our voyage estimator here in, in the, in the, the uh, example. We also have the fleet level uh, overall calculations available already. And of course, a lot of new features coming up all the time. But let's take a look on this voyage. We have one voyage from Trieste to, to Rotterdam. Traditional fuel consumption with this uh, medium-sized tanker would be about uh, 703 tons of fuel. And uh, first case, we, we estimate that with e-methanol, uh, to, to be complete 2025, we would need to, on this voyage, consume 14 tons of e-methanol to be exactly on the, on the target. And the cost uh, on the bottom right graph, you can see uh, cost comparison for HFO solution where you actually uh, don't do anything, you con continue using HFO, pay all the emission costs, fuel or maritime penalties, you end up to something like $400,000 for the kind of fuel related costs for this voyage. And while you would be consuming E-methanol and be exactly on this fuel or maritime target, you reach level uh, 371 and this is based on HFO price 600 bucks per ton and uh, e-methanol price 1100 US dollars per, per ton. Uh, here is a cost breakdown for the same so where did this uh, 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 different cost factors for consuming only HFO come from so total fuel cost here on the top 236,000 and, and then ATS cost 132,000 and, and EU fuel maritime penalties 2025 about 30,000 and then this kind of optimal mix 
uh, with e-methanol, then uh, we don't need to pay the penalties. So we pay a little bit less ETS cost because we have now a mix of HFO and e-methanol that doesn't need to pay for the emissions in place. So that we, we end up to 130,000 tons and, and the fuel cost 240 tons. But overall, it's uh, cheaper with the e-methanol in this example. And I'm very soon finalized with my time, but here is also an example with the biofuel fame uh, that has 70% reduction in, in, in emissions, the similar numbers. So this doesn't require any, any uh, investment for the, uh, for the CapEx for methanol vessel, for example, requires new engine system, new type of engine system, which costs extra, but biofuel doesn't. And with 1400 per, you, per, per ton uh, biofuel, uh, the cost for this voids would be the green number here on the bottom, bottom right, $382,000. So if we compare here, slightly more than this e-methanol option. So even the e-methanol is uh, per energy unit more expensive because of this uh, lower carbon intensity, you, you, you reach better overall cost. Okay, I exceeded already my time. I had a couple more examples here, but let's skip those and, and give the floor back to Carl. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you very much, Risto. That's fantastic. And you've got a question there from Aline from Poten asking about the carbon intensity of blue versus green ammonia. I think the difference is that uh, blue ammonia, the carbon capture is only 90% efficient. So uh, whereas green ammonia, be uh, no carbon at all. But I'll leave you if you want to answer that one. But we'll go to uh, Christy Assayi now, who's uh, with Zero North. Um, so Zero North is a very interesting company. Um, but we're asked uh, Christy to talk about... Uh, ways to communicate with uh, charters with the electronic standards. So the company's in Copenhagen, but Christy, I think, is uh, joining us from Greece. So I shall pass over to Christy. Cheers. Thank you so much. Yes, joining from sunny Athens here to talk about implementation of emissions reporting requirements and the path towards a data consensus. So my agenda for today is to quickly brush over Zero North as a company and then present the situation when we look at how fragmented the industry is in emissions requirements and regulation like previously touched upon by the other panelists, as well as the fragmentation in the industry from a stakeholder perspective. And then we'll get to the solution, which is the data consensus, which we've been working on with Energy Leap. About Zero North, so for those who haven't heard about Zero North, we are a tech scale-up based in Copenhagen and we've grown rapidly since the founding of the company in 2020 through various acquisitions and we now have more than 4,500 vessels on the platform. Our services are organized under different umbrellas. And you can see we have vessel reporting solutions, weather advisory, vessel optimization, routing, so on and so forth. All of which services connect into what we call the data flywheel effect, which is the Zero North ecosystem for um, uh, the, the data ecosystem we have in-house. And really the focus of uh, my session today is to look at the vessel reporting and the emission analytics solutions. So when we think about um, the different stakeholders on the Zero North platform, we have all the different uh, personas in uh, the shipping value chain, but really when we think about emissions reporting and environmental compliance, the two key services we should be looking at are the vessel reporting tool, as well as the emissions reporting and analytics solution. So our vessel reporting solution works both offline and online on our cloud-based application for our customers to be able to customize the reports that they will request the master to report on on a daily level. And uh, also we are part of the DNV integrated uh, partner solution where all the reports that are coming through the vessel reporting solution can be passed on to GNV for our joint customers for a seamless um, process of EUMRV and IMODCS reporting. 
But once we've unlocked the critical data points in a validated way through the vessel reporting application, we're able to tie that hand in hand with our emissions reporting and analytics solution, which automates all of the different reports that uh, our customers have to prepare, as well as provide all of the insights into CII, UETS, Fuel EU, um, all of the acronyms around the um, uh, compliance. But I'm not here to sell Zero North. So talking about how fragmented the industry is around emission pathways. So that has been touched upon by the other panelists, but let me iterate here that we are facing a situation where different policies are setting different climate alignment targets depending on uh, the, the, the regulatory body. So the IMO was following a different trajectory than the EU. And now just as per MEPC in July, they're going to revise that to align with a close to zero by 2050 trajectory, which means that the CII trajectories is going to, to be revised. But then also we are faced with big corporations like energy majors and uh, big charterers that have committed to even stricter emissions reduction trajectories, which are the science-based target that are aligned with the Paris Agreement of a 1.5 degree scenario. So cutting the emissions by 2040 as opposed to 2050. So when we are faced with all of those different uh, frameworks and reporting requirements, how do we um, match those to the different uh, reporting standards? And then not only do we have a fragmented industry in terms of targets and trajectories, but we also have an industry which is extremely fragmented in terms of use cases and um, personas. So if you think about a cargo owner, the cargo owner would be focused on getting access to the scope three emissions, so the emissions of the ship that is transporting their cargo. Whereas the charterer would be looking at a different set of KPIs, which is balancing the commercial and the environmental cost and identifying the best ship to charter for a given voyage. The ship owner is also going to be concerned with compliance with the IMO DCS and the UMRV reporting, as well as minimizing their EUA exposure for the UETS. Further down uh, the value chain at the core is the crew that is on board that have to manage all of the different activities when it comes to reporting different um, reporting standards, filling out fields and fields and hundreds of fields of noon reports every day. And then we also have the bunker procurement and the bunker supply personas, which are going to be crucial to bring on board uh, for fuel EU, like we heard from Risto, because we need to know how do I optimize planning and procurement in line with the carbon content and the life cycle of the emissions. So not only did we have a fragmented uh, emissions reporting requirements and targets, but also we have fragmented personas, use cases, and competing interests when it comes to data sharing. So faced with this situation, what we aim to do at Zero North and why it's we partnered with the Energy Leap organization as well, is how do we get to a consensus around what is the critical data set that we need to agree on for environmental and compliance reporting across the value chain? So you might say that, oh, but noon reports have been around for years, nothing has changed. Well, actually something changed. What has changed is that the reports that are coming out of noon reports are being used for use cases that were unprecedented before. So all of the CII correction factors, for example, how do we calculate birth to birth emissions for the UA reporting, UHS? How do we prepare a scope three emissions report for cargo owners for the sea cargo charterer? So you have all of these different applications that came up for the usage of moon reports and all of those different stakeholders that have a stake in different 
aspect of the data. So how can we position ourselves to be the middleman between the crew and the vessel that is reporting on all of these data fields and sharing it with the relevant stakeholders at the right time? To get to that point, what we have done with the Energy Leap organization, which is a organization of the major energy majors for providing data standards, we looked at the data that is coming from tankers specifically and uh, gas LNG carriers to look at the state of uh, uh, the data inventory. What data is coming out of the usual noon and event reports versus what are the data fields required for the CII reporting, for the sea cargo charter reporting, and for the additional class reporting. Once we've looked at the, the, the data inventory, we proceeded in doing a gap analysis as to the Zero North application. And all of the other members also went on to do a gap analysis in terms of, oh, for example, were we capturing cargo quantity reported at every cargo loading and discharge events or not? Because otherwise we can't calculate the EEOI metric. Did we have a good tool to be able to stamp the finish with engine uh, during a port report, for example? So being able to do this gap analysis in terms of what are the data fields that are needed for the different reporting requirements versus what was happening in our own system today was critical to get to this standard that we've developed with Energy Deep and published. We have some action points moving forward to extend that framework beyond tankers to cover the tri-segment as well, and to map that um, uh, framework to the ISO standard as well that the Smart Maritime Network has, uh, has come up with for naming a unit convention when it comes to, to noon reports. So really the message that uh, I wanna come across today is it's all well and nice to have all of those emissions reporting requirements and regula regulations coming up, but often those are coming from the top down and it's difficult to reconcile what are the practical bottom up implementation practices that need to happen. And a very low hanging fruit is tweaking the noon report um, system to be able to seamlessly comply with those requirements and streamline aggregating the data up to the different requirements. So I have added a link here to the standard that is available for consultation and I'm sure you'll be accessing the, the slides, but I'll also drop it in the Q&A box for um, more easy access. Thank you very much and looking forward to the panel discussion. Well, well, thank you very much, Christy. So I invite all the speakers to put all their uh, ca cameras back on now. Um, we've just got seven minutes left. Um, what I thought perhaps we could do is give everybody two minutes to come back to the original question. Well, I mean, if you imagine the, the viewer is uh, somebody responsible for digital technology in a company, on one hand, this is a great time for people who like digital technology because this stuff is so difficult. But if you like technology, technology can solve, can solve all these problems, but it also needs to be thought about very carefully. Maybe if we go in the order that uh, you presented, so Anders, Petter, then Risto and, uh, and Christy, but would you like to give us sort of a minute and a half of advice for uh, somebody responsible for IT strategy in a shipping company, what you think they should be thinking about now? Should we go for Andreas? Um, <clears throat> sure, Carl. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, kind of a difficult question, but... You know, I think I think actually this webinar series has has answered it uh, well. So I think the the starting point is to go back and and listen to the to the YouTube uh, recordings. I mean, you know, from everything from Raw Labs talking about uh, how to uh, do data collection um, as a discrete uh, service to being able to put. Uh, modular applications on top of that. I mean, that in itself, to me, is a is an important first step of of you know 
managing your high frequency uh, data collection and uh, platform, being able to push that to the cloud and um, doing that with a provider that doesn't lock you into uh, their end user applications, but having a relatively speaking open uh, platform to, to add applications. I think that gives um, I think that gives the optionality to the end user uh, beyond anything else. Um, and that's also how we have been thinking about our applications to be able to, to sort of plug on to, 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 to these type of um, um, data collection platforms and, and try to be as independent and po as possible towards the data providers. Yeah, I can add, yeah. add quick, quickly to that as well, <clears throat> so supporting what Andrea says. I think key here mm -hmm. to have control of the data quality, mm. a data stream, and try to no, use it for no, different purposes I, for two I, I reasons. That's that. smart because then you can check the data quality once and I can share it for commercial purposes, for tech, all the technical purposes. And it's also to the benefit of the crew because there's a lot of double reporting going on. That's stressful. That's also reducing the data quality. So sharing the data, uh, that's a com also a commercial win for, for many of us here and others. Uh, we shouldn't be too afraid of it. And luckily the industry is changing there from only 10, 15 years ago when no one wanted to share anything in shipping. So I think it's a positive trend there. And I can also emphasize the fact that it's often not clear which stakeholders need access to which data. Because if you think about it, the data sets are huge. Not everyone is interested in the same portion of, of data. So being able to agree on what is the critical set of subfields relevant for whom and for which use case is really important to agree on as an industry. Yeah, there's a different debate about data and digitalization, because I think there's a lot of people talking about data, all these standard bodies, like I think that's kind of well handled, but the digitalization part, I feel is not well handled at all. That's my, I don't know, Risto, do you want to uh, get a last word? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, maybe a little bit different type of perspective. I think what is important is to start to prepare for the future and the future is looking like a lot of new expenses, a uh, multitude of different types of strategies and getting those, getting your alternatives in control with, with a good tool set is a um, is really good starting point. And then of course, once you have selected your strategy, having the tools in place to monitor that you are actually achieving what you planned and, 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 and be, have the readiness to change the strategy in case for example, certain alternative fuel price volatility will kick in. So that's my giveaway for the for the for this last minute. Yeah. I mean, just we've got one more minute. If anybody got any thoughts that this whole gap between data and digitalization. So Christy kind of mentioned it, but I, mean, I often think that they're going in two separate worlds now that uh, there's data standards is one world and then digitalization and the software tools is a different world and they're both extremely important and uh I don't know, Christy. Did you want? Did I interrupt you there? But <laughs> you wanted to add something. Yeah. You gave me the answer right there. Oh, okay. It's okay. very important not to 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 separate both. So data standard and digitalization goes hand in hand. You can't have digitalization if you didn't agree on what you're going to digitalize and what you're going to share. And the other way around as well. There is no point in getting to data sharing standard if you can't actually share this data in an integrated way across systems. Systems. Yeah, yeah, they're very different skills, though, I suppose, isn't it? But uh, um, we're in the last minute now. So I'll, that's, I'll just thank everybody. And I think that's been a fantastic uh, view of the future. If you think things are difficult now, they're going to be harder in uh, 10 years. But if you've got the kind of skill set for this kind of thing, this is a great future for you. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'll pass back to Farah for the closing words. Cheers. Thank you to our guest speakers, Andrea Spreck, Christy Asayi, Peter Anderson, and Risto Karivanta, and to all our viewers. We'll be sending you a YouTube video link soon and contact details if you have any further questions. Join us for our next webinar on the 5th of December with Cobham, which you can book online at our website. Goodbye. Oh, cheers, thank you. Bye-bye.